I am happy to introduce our last keynote speaker, Julia Reda. She's member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party since 2014. She has a legislative focus on copyright and internet policy issues. She was therefore responsible for the Parliament's evaluation of the copyright reform, which was very well received. Today she talks about um, free software and public administration. She says if the code is public, the public also has a responsibility. She will talk about how and why public administrations should care and promote free software, should also care about the code and about its security. Please welcome Julia Reda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk about uh, the relationship between free and open source software and government. Um, being a politician, not a very surprising topic, but uh, from what I heard, it is a topic that has resonated with quite a lot of the uh, talks uh, this weekend. And uh, it's the, certainly a topic of a lot of interest, whether and how governments and public administrations are using free software. And uh, there are also lots of good arguments about that that uh, we've heard about uh, how free and open source software can make you more independent from a specific vendor. Uh, it can help the administrations to adapt to new uh, um, tasks. And of course, it can also save cost. But uh, these are all different arguments that I don't want to go into uh, so much in this talk. What I do want to talk about more fundamentally is uh, what is a government and uh, what does that have to do with free software. Um, on a very fundamental level, at least the ideal is that government is all of us. Uh, it should serve everybody and it should be accountable to everybody. And one very important function that even the most uh, critical uh, people of governments recognize what a government does is that it provides infrastructure. So it makes sure that there are streets, it makes sure that there are cables in the ground, perhaps it doesn't actually run the internet and telephone services, but at least it makes sure that they are available and safe to use. But um, we can argue that for civic software, for software that is used by the government, uh, especially in the interaction with the public, that this is also a public service. And uh, the only software philosophy that would really make sense for a government that uh, takes its accountability to, to the public seriously is that it uses, it takes responsibility for, and it also contributes to free and open source software. Um, I think that this task, making sure that government uses free and open source software, is today more urgent than ever. Um, that's because of two different distinct developments in society and technology that uh, together can become quite dangerous. The one is the importance of technology in society. The other uh, is the, what I call losing the freedom to tinker. Um, the combination of these two developments means that uh, technological project progress can lead not to a gain in autonomy like we have all hoped, but to a loss in autonomy of the people. That the great promise of autonomy, that it will empower everybody, uh, that uh, the free and open source software community also stands for, is at stake. So if we lose this fight, um, the technology can become a tool just for the powerful in society and not for everybody. So uh, I've chosen a rather uh, provocative uh, term for the role of software in society, that algorithms rule the world. Uh, you've probably read this in newspapers, usually in kind of a context where they say that software is somehow magic and only very few people know what's happening and we're all slaves uh, to, to those new software magicians. This is not what I'm talking about. And it's also not uh, uh, to be understood in the sense of uh, some politicians who are basically saying, let's ban all technology. But uh, I mean this more in the sense uh, that computers are no longer limited to particular parts of our lives, but rather that they are an integral part of the physical world. So uh, the best example of that, I guess, is that nobody really talks about real life anymore when they mean offline. 
Um, I've uh, come across this development, uh, the importance of software, in several sometimes rather unexpected parts of my work. And uh, one that was most revealing to me was my work in the inquiry committee on the so-called Dieselgate, the diesel exhaust fume scandal. Um, this is not just a scandal where governments turned a blind eye to obvious fraud by powerful companies. Uh, it's also a scandal that is based on the fact that cars are computers on wheels. And our legislation is not adapted to this reality. Uh, the defeat devices, that is uh, the cheat codes inside the cars, it can be completely software-based. And actually, in the process for allowing a car to go on the road, there is no check even to make sure whether the software run on the car that is tested is actually the same as the software that is sold to customers. So even uh, if the car that uh, is tested in the laboratory is completely safe, does uh, not uh, have too high emissions, if it's the software alone that can um, influence this, uh, our tests are comp completely um, inadequate for actually testing whether the cars on the road are safe because from a, from a purely um, computer point of view, they could be completely different re devices simply because they're running completely different software. Uh, another interesting aspect of this is that defeat devices can actually be legal in a very uh, small uh, exception, and that is if it's necessary to protect the engine from damage. And uh, unfortunately, there is actually no requirement in the law that a car maker who uses such a defeat device that is switching off uh, the NOx abatement technology simply to save the engine, that they don't have to disclose this to uh, the regulators in any way. That means they don't have to explo expose the source code, not even to the regulators, and they don't have to uh, explain what the software on the car actually actually does. Um, what this means in practice, uh, this is a slide from uh, the CCC talk given by Felix Domke and Daniel Lange this year, is um, that in the case of Felix Domke's uh, VW car, there was actually a function programmed into uh, the car that was uh, switching off uh, the NOx abatement technology whenever the distance driven by the car was deviating significantly from the test procedure that was written into the law. So... Um, uh, in order to find this out, I mean, this is a very obvious fraud, of course. But uh, in order to find this out, uh, Felix Domke actually had to reverse engineer the software on his own car. And uh, of course, it would make a lot more sense if a car manufacturer actually had to disclose the software to the regulators and explain if there is a defeat device, what exactly is it for and how the hell is this supposed to protect the engine? Um, Another area where we're seeing an increasing importance of software is uh, robotics and uh, implants. So it's not just that the cars uh, that are driving on our streets will eventually not be driven by people anymore and will become robots. Uh, we're also introducing robots into healthcare um, at the workplace in a, in a way that they're directly interacting with humans. And we also have software running inside humans. Um, a less scary uh, example of this is perhaps a friend of mine who wears a cochlear implant, which is a digital hearing aid um, that can transform an, uh, a sound into a digital signal and allows him to hear. Uh, if there is a, a, a software vulnerability in this kind of device, perhaps the worst thing that could happen to you is that you don't hear something that is there, or perhaps even that you hear something that is not there. Um, Something more scary, uh, a more scary example of software not doing what it's supposed to would be software on a pacemaker. And uh, there was an excellent uh, talk by the security researcher Mary Mo uh, called Unpatchable, Living with a Vulnerable Implanted Device. Now, uh, th that sounds a lot more scary. Actually, in her case, she was wearing a pacemaker. Uh, she was not able to um, inspect the source code on this pacemaker, and it turned out that it had a bug. And when uh, she suddenly fell down when she was walking up a flight of stairs, they couldn't simply see what exactly the software was doing. Instead, they basically had to put her on a, tre on a treadmill and troubleshoot her. Um, <laughs> So uh, what Mary Mo is saying about this is that I want to know what code runs on my body, which I think is an incredibly reasonable demand uh, from government. 
But um, this is also something that the European Parliament is discussing, thankfully. Uh, however, whenever there's a good idea of what we should do with new technology, there's also a bad idea. So the European Parliament is also discussing whether robots and artificial intelligence uh, that create new works, for example, uh, an algorithm-created um, song, whether there should be copyright on that, which I think is a terrible idea. Um, so... These questions are definitely something that is under development in the governments uh, at the moment and something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, something that's a much older debate is the use of technology in elections. Um, in the US, uh, voting systems are, have not been considered critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, even though there are lots of independent reports that show that a lot of the um, voting systems, the voting software that is being used on a municipal or regional level, even though it's known that it's unsafe, it isn't really treated like much of a problem. Um, another good example from Estonia that is already doing online elections, um, they had actually one invalid vote via the online uh, voting system, which apparently comes from one member of the Pirate Party. So I think uh, it's really important that we also uh, have the possibility to, to inspect any kind of software that is basically being used um, to fulfill extremely important uh, functions. Of course, the Esto Estonian online election system is not 100% free and open source software. Um, then there's uh, also this, this debate about whether Facebook algorithms can influence election outcomes, which I guess are more social debates, but really show um, that, that there is uh, quite an issue that needs to be discussed. Uh, one more example, what we call predictive uh, policing, which is basically the use of data about previous crimes to predict uh, where future crimes are going to take place. Um, I think this is a really good example of showing that machines uh, basically can only learn from our own dumb behavior. Uh, so, for example, this predictive policing has been um, uh, criticized for perpetuating racist stereotypes. Uh, so, for example, in the war on drugs, um, on average, uh, white people take more drugs than black people and also engage more selling and buying. However, the number of black people actually arrested uh, on drug crimes is a lot higher. So if you base your predictions of future crimes uh, on what has happened before, you're not actually basing it on uh, the real incidents of crime, but only on the crime that we know about. So um, there is a, a real danger that if we don't know how exactly this kind of uh, software works, we can't find out whether there are biases that are uh, built into it. And I think from a fundamental rights perspective, it's extremely important that whenever a public administration, the police or a government does something that is directly to your disadvantage, that they owe you an explanation of why they came to this conclusion. And uh, if we use proprietary software in order to make decisions, this is certainly not the case. And uh, perhaps on a less serious note, uh, everything's becoming Internet of Things. Um, sometimes makes free software more critical because if you have Windows 10 running on your fridge, basically if you have more proprietary software running on everything, there are more fun ways how your software can fail. Um, so this is one part of the problem, but I think uh, uh, the fact that there is more technology around us is not a problem as such. Uh, it becomes a problem if at the same time we are legally barred from controlling this software. And this is something uh, that's happening on quite a lot of fields. Um, Edward Felton, uh, who was an academic and is nowadays uh, the deputy uh, CTO of the United States, he coined this uh, term of the freedom to tinker in the early 2000s. And it's uh, one that goes beyond just the mere act of being able to access source code, but it's uh, a full freedom to inspect, to understand, to repair, to modify both software and hardware. And it's based on the idea that you can't actually... Um, 
learn to write only by reading. So you do have to interact with the system in order to fully understand it and also to be able to build something new based on the things that you've learned. So this freedom to tinker is really important as the basis of education, uh, as the basis for innovation and also uh, in order to give people autonomy over the devices that they buy. And I think uh, this freedom to tinker should be protected in a similar way uh, as the freedom of speech. Um, there are recently some lobby groups who are working particularly on protecting and enshrining this freedom to tinker. Uh, a lot of them in the, in, at the moment are based in the US. Uh, there's, for example, I Am the Cavalry, which is a, a group of um, uh, security researchers that are really trying to make uh, the, the hardware that uh, is part of our lives uh, trustworthy and secure and allow people to understand them. There's also the right to repair group and other groups uh, that are working on this theme. Um, but the freedom of tinker is under attack from a, a lot of different types of legislation. Um, one is uh, quite a fundamental problem with uh, the way that digital content is dealt with uh, in the law. That is that uh, information is governed quite differently from physical goods. So as a simple example, if I buy a book, I own this book. Uh, if I buy an ebook, I have a usage license that is perhaps not transferable. So if I have a big collection of ebooks, I can't actually give this collection to my children when I die. Um, and of course, when more and more products are kind of a mixture of uh, a physical good and information, what uh, the manufacturers and the industry try to do is uh, to transpose this logic from uh, the dealing with information onto those products and try to rent us things rather than uh, have us buy them. Um, one good of example of this was the controversy around the John Deere tractor, where the manufacturer was basically saying that the people who had bought this tractor were not allowed uh, to actually repair the tractor themselves because they were just license holder of this tractor and uh, uh, they were not able to modify it. Um, yeah, it was said in the uh, in the... Uh, beginning uh, of this talk that I had uh, made some recommendations around copyright reform that were actually adopted by the European Parliament. For example, uh, I fought for public domain status of official works. So that would mean that any kind of work of art, of uh, photography, writing, whatever, that was created by an employee of public administration during their work time was considered to be in the public domain and was not covered by copyright. Uh, another uh, demand was that the circumvention of technological protections uh, for legal purposes. So, for example, if you have legally bought a CD and you've already paid the levy for being able to make copies of it, then you should be able to actually circumvent the DRM to make copies. Um, even though quite a lot of uh, uh, such common sense demands were supported by the European Parliament, uh, the European Commission's proposal for a copyright reform uh, has now been leaked and all of these common sense ideas have been shot down. Uh, instead, we're going to get a, a new right for news publishers to control how we share news online and an obligation for any kind of internet platforms uh, that uh, have user-generated content to use uh, technology to scan for copyright infringement. So, um, this is a topic for another talk and I will be working on, on stopping these terrible developments uh, for months to come. But uh, it's also another uh, way of showing that also in the area of copyright, there is no uh, uh, positive development yet uh, that would actually give us more control um, over the stuff uh, that we buy. Um, another area uh, that is becoming more and more concerning are trade secrets. Uh, so trade secrets uh, started out as being a way of defending against anti-competitive behavior. So basically, if you're one car manufacturer and somebody from the other car manufacturer breaks into uh, your office and steals... Uh, um, all your plans, that would be something that would have traditionally been covered by trade secrets. But nowadays, um, uh, it's no longer about whether or not there's a competitor involved. It's the information as such that is protected. So a car maker can claim, for example, that the software on the car is a trade secret and therefore the regulator can't even look at it to find out whether they're cheating uh, on the emissions tests. And of course, uh, the regulator is in no way in a, competi in a competitive situation uh, to this car maker. So it actually doesn't make any sense. 
But uh, quite uh, concerningly, the United States are slowly introducing this uh, into trade agreements with other parts of the world. And their argument is, if you allow governments to require companies to disclose software, then basically China is going to copy all our uh, innovation and uh, give the information to their own companies. So I think we have to make sure that if we want to mandate more source code disclosure um, from manufacturers, we have to make sure that uh, in international trade, our governments actually remain able to do this. Um, there are not just legal, but also social developments uh, that I think make uh, free software and open systems more important. Um, uh, on the 28th Chaos Communication uh, Congress, Cory Doctorow was warning about uh, a future in which more and more devices have their functionality crippled on purpose. So something that is sold to you that could be a fully functioning computer um, is somehow locked in that only certain functions of it uh, work. And of course, we know nowadays that uh, with every smartphone and every smart fridge and smart home we buy, uh, that we are coming closer to this reality because the consumer simply lose the expectation that if they buy a computer they're actually able to do what they want with it and that they're actually able to install the operating system they want and so on. So um, I think that's definitely a really uh, important and dangerous uh, social and technological development. Um, finally, uh, there are also some uh, moves from new laws uh, regarding what kind of software and firmware can be installed on routers. Uh, once again, there's kind of a public um, security argument for that. That is that uh, um, the manufacturers of the routers should make sure that users cannot uh, accidentally or non-accidentally use the wrong spectrum with these devices. Um, but at the same time, in order to um, allow competition, for example, the FCC in the United States has uh, found that uh, they should allow uh, firmware from third parties to be installed. But how do you do this? How do you, on the one hand, limit what uh, the third party software can do, and on the other hand, still keep it open to different uh, uh, firmwares? So I think what's going to happen, one possible reconciliation is that on routers, we're also going to have kind of trusted computing solutions uh, with a cryptographic signature for any kind of firmware that can be installed on them. And uh, this is already the case for most computers that are being sold with secure boot and so on. And um, is, of course, especially for, for lay people, making the install installation of Linux uh, incredibly more challenging. So, uh, a lot of these examples are kind of bad things that are going on in the legislative process, but also some broader um, societal things. So, what can the government do about it? And can we actually rely upon the government uh, to do anything? Um, w w I think uh, it's important uh, to recognize that uh, we can... Um, influence the government uh, in activities if we actually decide to prioritize on this and to not just build software but to actually um, um, make sure that governments understand how free and open source software is in their, um, in their interest. And for that we do need the practical arguments uh, that government administrations already rely on, on free and open source software in a lot of cases and that's in their interest that the software is secure, that it's well maintained and that there's a community behind behind it that can actually do its work and is not hindered uh, by counterproductive legislation. So in other words, the government has to start taking responsibility um, and further the goals of security, safety, etc. that uh, are um, represented by the free software movement. So um, there are some positive examples of how this is being done. Uh, there are simply funding uh, ways like the prototype fund in Germany where basically uh, money is directly given to open source projects and uh, the prototype fund also um, not just gives money but also helps the projects deal with the bureaucracy around it and make the process uh, easier for people who are not used to working with, with public administrations on a daily basis. Um, but uh, perhaps a more 
uh, well, pretty, pretty obvious thing from recent news that's also important are security audits. So in 2014, we had the Heartbleed and Shell Shock vulnerabilities uh, that demonstrated that uh, a lot of infrastructure is relying on free and open source software, but quite often uh, there is no responsibility, even from large companies and governments that are using this software, to actually contribute to uh, its uh, uh, functioning, to finding software bugs and to making sure um, that this that they're giving something back to the community that uh, is developing these tools. Um, so the European Commission, upon the initiative of a, a colleague of mine and myself, uh, has started a pilot project uh, for free and open source software auditing. Now, we had to somehow convince the Commission that it's a good idea to try to build relationships with the free software community and to show um, them how this also has a benefit for themselves. Um, so uh, some parts of this project that have already taken place is that um, the European Commission was uh, investigating um, different methodologies for how to do audits, how uh, the, um, uh, the software code is being maintained and governed in different existing community projects, and also to do an inventory of all the free and open source software that is currently being used in the free software uh, in the um, European institutions. Um, or that they use in order to build uh, new software that is commissioned by themselves, so uh, existing software libraries, etc. And um, the purpose of this is also to find common interests, so to see, okay, this is a software that the European Commission is really relying on, but it also has uh, a great value to the community at large. So in order to find out uh, which projects actually do have this common interest and uh, that would be most interesting for um, this, the community to also uh, be looked into, uh, in order to do that, we, we did a public survey um, where uh, we basically asked out of a number of different free software projects that were in use in the institutions, uh, which ones the community would like to see audited. And uh, from this public survey, uh, we had uh, two projects that, that uh, got the most votes, namely the Apache HTTP server and uh, KeyPass. Um, of course, Apache is already widely used in uh, not just uh, in the European institutions, but also beyond. Um, KeyPass is actually not used by huge numbers inside uh, the Commission so far, but uh, it got a lot of public votes, and I think it's a good example of a user space software, so something uh, where uh, uh, the security is really important for the end user, and uh, there's uh, really, it, it makes sense to them why this kind of uh, software should be audited. So um, this two years pilot project is coming to an end. Uh, there's currently a company that uh, is doing um, the audit of uh, these two projects. And um, in the running of this project, uh, we've also run into some challenges that are mostly to do with how to make sure that uh, the European Commission as basically a public administration that so far has not had a lot of dealings with the free software community actually understand what they're doing, how they get the expertise from the community and how we can hold them accountable that they actually listen to it. And uh, in this process, uh, the Free Software Foundation Europe has been extremely uh, involved and, and really always trying to push us in the right direction because I have to say, as a member of parliament, uh, the, the amount of time that I can spend on running after a consultancy that is doing an audit uh, is limited. But uh, I think we do have uh, identified also how we can improve uh, this project. So we're trying to continue it to get uh, a budget for the next few years and uh, um, to eventually make it a permanent part of the EU budget. And one thing that we really want to do is uh, in the future to do a bug bounty program where we directly um, take uh, a large part of the money uh, that is put in the budget in order to um, make people, the experts in the community themselves, um, uh, look for bugs and get uh, remunerated for that. Um, so for projects like this, I think uh, the involvement of the community is really important, but also uh, the patience of the community, because of course, uh, working with a big administration uh, can be quite frustrating. And I think, uh, especially in these cases, it really pays off uh, to be organized as a community to actually have an advocacy organization that is doing this, uh, this work for you. Um, 
So what's going to happen next? What can we actually achieve? I think on the one hand, of course, simply developing the software, the direct action on that is incredibly important. But at the same time, it's also uh, very important to try to work within the system and to try uh, to build networks between the free software community and politicians who actually care about these issues, because I'm uh, certainly not the only one. Um, we can also look at some success stories where open source policies have been passed. Uh, there's recently been one in Bulgaria. Uh, there's also the US federal source code policy, which, uh, you know, are not perfect policies. So what the US is doing, for example, is saying, okay, all uh, software that uh, a government agency commissions needs to be reusable for the entire government, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. Um, and they have a goal of actually publishing 20% of the software that they commission as open source software, um, which is, well, not what we are going to aim for, but it's certainly uh, better than nothing and more than uh, a lot of European governments are doing at the moment. Um, the European Commission does have an open source policy, but uh, it's very... Uh, well, very basic in the sense that, for example, they commit to not disadvantaging open source solutions in public procurement, uh, which is nice. I mean, I think uh, if, if uh, simply offering a free software or open source solution were considered a disadvantage, that would certainly be a problem. But where we want to get to, of course, is that they actually consider it an, an advantage and that they make it a requirement. Um, so here's my call for action, and this is uh, something um, that I think the, the Free Software Foundation has already laid the groundwork for, um, is that we need to move towards a sustainable pro uh, public procurement system, and that uh, every government in the EU, as well as the European Commission, actually have a free software policy that means that all um, the uh, software that is um, developed with public money will actually be published in a public... Uh, uh, under a free license and is reusable for anyone because uh, at the end the government is acting in the public interest. Um, the FSFE is already starting a mapping exercise to see what is already out there, uh, what inefficiency could be addressed with free and open source software. And if you want to, to get active in that, I think they definitely uh, welcome uh, people who may be experts with uh, what different municipalities are doing or simply have the technical expertise to contribute to that. So I think uh, our goal needs to be to make government not just tolerate and use free and open source software, but to actually promote and improve it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Now it's time for question and answer. First, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, thoughts about auditing software. Um, I think it's not enough to just audit the code because that, uh, that is opening Pandora's box. So you also have to audit the processes of the people who create it. Are they actually reacting to security uh, problems? Um, which brings the next problem. If you audit code and you find a huge number of bugs in KeepS, for example, you are being the nice person, you put them all in their bugzilla, and then you have a problem. Um, so it also has to be fixed. How can you make sure uh, that happens? Should that be uh, done by public resources as well? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, uh, one thing that we really try to push for, and as far as I know that actually has happened, is that before uh, the commission or the company that the commission has uh, put in charge of doing the audit, before they actually start doing the audit, they do have to get in touch with the community, with the developer, that they know that this audit is going on, um, that they are the first to be informed if something is found, and that they can actually process uh, this input in a meaningful way. Um, I think if we, if we go towards the model of bug bounties, of course, actually fixing the bug uh, can be a part of that. And I think that's probably more easy to do um, if we create incentives for the people who are already developing the software that they can actually 
uh, work on fixing those bugs. Um, the, the processes are actually part of, um, uh, of the pilot project in the sense that the first step of it was that uh, there was a comparison being done between the, the processes of software development within the European Commission and in different free software projects. Um, however, there, there were uh, apparently some problems with that in the sense that uh, not every free software project that was supposed to be contacted actually was contacted. And uh, so some, some inaccurate information actually ended up in the report. Um, I think if we uh, do manage to get uh, funding to improve uh, or to continue the process and uh, to, to do um, a next step on, based on this pilot project, this criticism um, that also to, to a large extent was co um, collected by FSFE and uh, given to me is extremely invaluable because uh, I, I don't have the expertise to know uh, everything that may go wrong. So to have actually the community actively involved and know who to tell either uh, in the parliament or in the commission if something's going wrong is really important. Hi, thanks for the talk here. Um, so I wanted to ask, you said that uh, software that is uh, developed with uh, public resources should be released and should be free and released as open source, right? So I want to, you might have said this, but uh, what is the status of that? I mean, is, it, is that something that is about to happen? Um, is that happening in every city, in every European country? Mm. What, how does that work? At the moment, it's certainly not happening everywhere. It's, I think it's more the exception rather than the rule that uh, a public administration actually has a policy like that. And um, we do have uh, similar rules, for example, in the, um, um, in the sciences funding by the European Union. So the Horizon 2020 program, for example, requires you... Um, to release all the research results under open access. Uh, but unfortunately, so far, this doesn't include um, the, the, any software that may have been programmed as part of this research exercise. So I think at the moment, there's really uh, a lack of, um, uh, well, really commitment to this goal. And as far as I know, uh, at least uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, Bulgaria is the only country in the U EU that I know of where this is uh, um, basically a national level government policy. There may be others, but in certain, uh, certainly in Germany it's not the case. Yeah, thanks for the talk. So sometimes it appears to be like you're the only uh, person in the European Parliament, at least for me, to uh, understand some topics. And um, what is the situation in the European Parliament and what are, would be your suggestions for normal people like me, just FSF uh, e-fellows, uh, to support the cause and to prevent stupid decisions in the Commission? And maybe uh, you know also in European Parliament someone who can be just nudged in the right direction, right? Mm. Or, yeah. Well, uh, I think there are different uh, strategies. I'm certainly not the only person who is walking, uh, who is working on these topics, but sometimes you have to uh, draw uh, a, a connection between the thing that the parliamentarian is really interested in and then your topic. So, for example, all my colleagues from the Green Party are extremely interested in the Dieselgate scandal and how exactly it worked uh, because they're really uh, uh, interested in doing something about pollution. So, um, being able to somehow connect uh, the, the topics to the topics that people are already working on is a really useful uh, strategy. But I think another thing that's important is that um, for volunteers, it is still quite difficult to have the same level of influence as uh, the industry. So actually having an association um, that is represented in Brussels with uh, people working full time on this is also really important. But um, in comparison to, I would say, a national member of parliament, the number of people who contact MEPs directly is still rather limited. So if it's about stopping a bad proposal, then sometimes just getting lots and lots of people to write to their representatives, to all their representatives about this can be uh, a useful strategy. But that works much better if you want to stop something bad than if you want to get uh, people actually interested in, in uh, changing something for the better. But um, we do have a, um, 
an intergroup uh, th that is made up of people from different political parties that deals with internet policy on a broader level. And they do sometimes um, take positions. I mean, it's certainly the more progressive members of the parliament, even though uh, there are people represented from all over the board. And for example, they have been really active in opposing uh, this new copyright uh, for publishers for newspaper articles. So um, I think, um, yeah, if you, if you want specific names, uh, you can certainly write me an email. But other than that, I think organizing as an association and actually sending people to Brussels uh, to knock on people's doors is extremely important. Hi. Um, what you've talked about there for free software is a, a very good move, but one of the problems at the moment is that if you report a security vulnerability against some closed source software, there's no requirement on the manufacturer to actually fix it. So are you making any moves towards actually requiring that manufacturers support software or at the very least provide definitions of when they'll support it and when they won't? Mm. Um, I'm not directly involved in this. I know that uh, one of my colleagues, Jan Philipp Albrecht, was trying to um, get some some uh, vulnerability disclosure requirements uh, into the Network and Information Security Directive, which is mostly about like uh, critical infrastructure and so on. Um, there are some moves uh, in in the areas of consumer law. So basically, if you buy a device, uh, that you have certain rights as a consumer as to continued support uh, of the software running on that. But um, this is really still in very early stages. And these are the only developments I can think of uh, where this is being addressed. But at the moment, there doesn't seem to be such a requirement. So we have as technology makers and especially government the responsibility to make all technology accessible to every citizen. Uh, you didn't talk a lot about that, but that's also an important thing to make software free. So anybody can extend them in different ways. There's many people with disabilities of any kind or uh, have not very powerful computers and so on. Does it matter mm. any kind of? So um, does that come up in conversations that, or somebody's also mentioning that mm. in the conversations? Um. We haven't actually made the connection between accessibility and free software uh, too much so far, but it's actually a really uh, good point. Um, the European Parliament recently uh, passed uh, the Web Accessibility Directive, which will at least force public administrations to make their websites and apps and so on um, freely accessible. Um, and of course, in, in many cases, actually doing that uh, can be much easier by using free and open source software, and you already have people um, who are kind of uh, working on the software also to make it more usable for themselves. And uh, so I hope that this can uh, give some positive impulses in this direction. Unfortunately, I mean, the Web Accessibility Directive alone, which is relatively limited in scope really to the government uh, uh, administrations, will still take years to, to go into effect. I mean, you basically have really strong lobbying from uh, the the uh, municipalities who are saying they don't have any money to do this, even though actually, you know, forcing somebody with a disability to uh, go personally to uh, the administration and have them um, uh, deal with the things that don't work in their software can be a lot more expensive. And I hope that uh, uh, there's going to be more of a change in the mindset uh, in the municipalities that making things accessible is actually a, a priority, a human rights issue, and also simply makes sense in their own uh, uh, procedures. This is something I'm uh, wondering about as somebody who's kind of involved with FSFE. Um, do you think that it would make sense for us as an organization to also target uh, national lobbying more or should we like focus our efforts on the EU because that makes the most sense? Um, I think both make sense because, for example, if you want uh, your municipal, uh, I don't know, your city council or your public administration to use free software, then the European Union will have a 
very difficult time mandating that. Uh, what you can get at the European Union is uh, to make sure that uh, we have sensible information policy law, so when it comes to uh, copyright, uh, to trade secrets and so on, and of course to get the European institutions to actually use and promote free software. But uh, as a general rule, um, the the um, national states, they have bigger budgets, they have a lot of uh, uh, oversight over the different public administrations that are really right in front of your doorstep. So I would say that definitely both approaches make perfect sense. Hi, uh, additional question on the releasing the software as open source. Uh, so as I understood, there is no plan to enforce that, right? It is more of a suggestion to the government to start making software and releasing it, or is there a law, is there any plan to enforce that? No, there is no law yet, so there, there is nothing to enforce, but I think uh, that should be our goal, and it's something uh, that um, I think if the government's really... Um, well, get informed about the topics, will realize that it actually makes sense for them too. But I think what would make the most sense for an organization like FSFE is to actually lobby for such a law to be put in place, uh, both uh, as regards the European institutions as well as on a national level. But at the moment, uh, such law doesn't exist in, well, pretty much all of the European countries. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, great speech. Um, I like the, uh, the fact that there are funds now to uh, do audit on security issues. I was wondering if it would be feasible to do aud uh, auditing on compliance to interoperability to see if software is actually following the standards that we set as a community. And currently, it's actually very profitable for, for companies to not follow interoperability standards, and this is costing us a lot of money. Um, mm. So it would be great if we would uh, set some money aside to actually check that uh, software that we're buying follows certain standards that we require because currently there's very little information about that. Yeah, um, usually uh, it's the member states that have to um, make sure that uh, European laws are being enforced and that there's actually enough money to enforce them. So I'm not 100% sure whether it's possible to pay for that through the EU budget because it would basically be well, admitting that the member states are not doing their jobs. Uh, what the Commission can do is, uh, if, a, if a member state is not um, uh, following its requirements, which us usually includes uh, enforcing the law, uh, the Commission can start an inf infringement procedure against uh, this state, which can become relatively costly for the state. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would have to look into that, whether it's possible for the Commission to actually, or for the European Union budget, to directly fund enforcement of existing laws, because, well, this is something that they should be doing anyway. Hey, so, um, in the US, I see some positive um, improvements, like you already mentioned this White House policy, which is of course not perfect. But what I also see in the US, and I at least had uh, heard two talks, like from the Digital Infrastructure Agency or something, and 18F, so they're like um, groups of people building up, I don't know exactly how the structure looks like, but basically government funded, who, who are writing free software, open source software, which is all like on GitHub and they're great people, they all do like a startup mentality and agile. Do you see any future for this in, in Europe? Because I think this would also drive this forward without any policies, because if you have a body of people uh, doing great work in free software, then you don't need to reach out to proprietary vendors anymore. Right. Um, well, as I understand this, um, uh, this project, the prototype fund is uh, that it does something like that. So it basically um, gives money directly to projects that are building open source software for, for different uses. And th those could, of course, also be 
um, uses that have a direct use inside the government. So, um, but you know, the prototype fund and also the um, open source uh, security audit by the commission, they have a budget of around a million euros. So uh, this is nice, but it's uh, basically just a, a, a start and it can't really uh, finance such projects on a grander scale. So from what you've described, I would think that probably these uh, projects have bit bigger budgets and that's um, probably something that we need to work on and therefore it's also important to make sure that these small projects that do exist actually become successful and uh, uh, that basically it becomes well uh, useful for a politician to promote something like that if they see okay this is something that people are interested in is something that can win them points then they're likely to try to do it again. Well, all this talk we've heard uh, now was mainly about software written by the government or for the government. Um, and all the scary things we've seen in the beginning um, were about uh, cars and pacemakers and uh, things that are certainly not written by the government or for the government. Um, wouldn't it make more sense to uh, uh, put pressure on that side to uh, uh, require uh, the companies that write that code to make the code um, free software so that it can be inspected? Um, sure. I think there's not always a, a clear line. Um, the, the same software is, uh, the, the same free and open source software is being used inside government and inside large corporations to some extent. But, uh, of course, a lot of the problems are with proprietary software. And, um, but I do think that the government will be much more likely to actually mandate, um, uh, disclosing of software in, in critical devices such as cars. Uh, is if they are already using open source software themselves. Because if they feel like this mandating can actually make uh, somehow their own uh, governmental procedures insecure, then they're probably much less likely to, to go down this route. So I think it's, it's probably important to go down both alleys. But um, as a first step, I think it's really important to kind of to try to get the government on your side on, the, on uh, these free software topics. And if they're not using free software themselves, then they're probably... Uh, not going to see the merits of it. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that um, not only software is important, but um, to be a computer distributors and the hardware distributors try to lock down the hardware in the last years, and it would be really important that we look at that and uh, say that it, have, it has to be possible to have open systems which are not in lockdown for government institutions. Mm. Yeah, or for anyone really. So one of those uh, laws uh, that uh, we are working on is this uh, router lockdown directive, or that's uh, what we like to call it, uh, where as far as I can tell, nobody realized at the time that this directive was passed that it would create problems for like Freifunk and uh, other open Wi-Fi communities and that it would make it difficult to run free software on routers. So um, I think basically having... Um, people uh, there who actually understand free software and who can um, look at the legislative process as it is going on and jump in there and point out problems uh, is sometimes all it takes. And at the time, there was nobody there who was doing that. So now we have to try to somehow avoid the problem uh, down the line as the member states are, are uh, transposing this directive into national laws. Thank you. Hey, I have a question regarding the open source audit. What are the arguments um, if somebody has concerns that the European Commission is helping one product by, don by funding their security audit and thus uh, making their position on the market better? 
Mm. Yeah, we were discussing that, but we decided it's not really a problem because if they find something, this uh, um, improvement at the end of the day benefits everyone. And if, for example, there's a fork uh, of this project um, that uh, is developing it in a different direction, which seems to be the case with KeePass to a pretty large extent, there's a good chance that uh, any any uh, vulnerability that could be found is also relevant for that other project. So, uh, of course, whenever... Um, the uh, government is funding something that is uh, uh, organized by citizens or organized by the private sector. Um, there may be uh, 10 different projects that don't get funded. And you can say that this is unfair, but uh, I think it would be uh, probably we would all be worse off uh, if we reacted to this by not having any public funding for uh, public interest goals at all. I have to say that Julia really has to leave in point. So there we have time for two last questions. Um, at least in the UK, we're seeing the increasing privatization of public services. Um, has there been any discussion that you've witnessed with regard to um, overseeing the use of proprietary software by these private organizations, but uh, providing essential public services like education? Well, there's certainly a discussion about all the problems uh, that we have uh, thanks to some of the privatizations that have taken place and how they have taken place. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the, the use of software by these companies as such is being addressed, but um, yeah, I would, I would have to look into that. I can't think of an example uh, right now. Final question. For you, the final question. So the aged cynic in me cannot help but remember that the, the proprietary software vendors have taken every opportunity to point to any areas in open source as being a big problem. And because they're open, you can see them whilst theirs are hidden. Is there any effort afoot to also take the pieces of closed source software that are being used by the commission and get them also audited <laughs> so that the, they can't go saying, oh, look at all these flaws that have now been found in open source. You know, they, they are then faced with the, well, yeah, and look at yours, which, um, yeah, they're not as easy to deal with, are they? Right. Uh, I have to admit I have not thought of that at all, but uh, I, I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very, very much. What an inspiring weekend we had, haven't we? I hope you guys have shared a lot of ideas, shared some software. Eric had shared his flu with me, so uh, before we carry on, I would like to invite KDE up here. They will be, uh, whoa. <laughs> they will be uh, doing their Academy Award, so I expect a lot of uh, film stars to come up here by now. Oh, there's our first film star. Okay, yeah, tradition time. So it's uh, the year of Academy again, and uh, I have the honor this year to give out the Academy Awards to people that have contributed a lot of good work to the KDE community. And we will start with the Non-Application Contribution Award, which has been decided by this year's jury to go to Alej Pohl for his continued work throughout all of KDE. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. You could have gotten lots of uh, developer awards as well, but we thought this one was good. <laughs> so um, then we continue with, I think, the application award, which goes to something uh, where we thought it's kind of odd that they 
didn't ever get the prize so far. And uh, this year, uh, the award goes to Christoph Kohlmann and Dominic Haumann for their work on KTEX editor K Wright and Kate. How long has it been? <laughs> 15 years? <laughs> Your time has come. <laughs> Thanks. You got a one. And then the jury thought that um, the jury award goes to another uh, developer and actually uh, the whole community. Uh, it's actually this year for Daniel Rattle and the other KD Pimsters for his work and their work on Akonadi and keeping our mail safe. So thanks a lot, Daniel. Where are you? Come up. Thank you, Dan. And last but, but not least, of course, uh, we want to thank and uh, please everyone give a big, big shout out to the organizers this year. And uh, please, Kenny, can you come up here and uh, receive your award for your work on actually making this event happen? Kenny Coyle, <laughs> it's you, yeah. Thank you. And thank you. And this prize definitely includes all the other volunteers from the other communities for helping out on this weekend. Thanks a lot, everyone. Well, we are in the uh, in the part of just saying thank you. So. I would like also to uh, say thank you to uh, the representatives up here. They are by far not the persons that done the most. I don't even remember seeing Lars at a single meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but they represent each of the subgroups that have been doing an excellent piece of work to make this happen. It's seven or eight months ago since somebody got the idea, why don't we get these, uh, what at least uh, on the face value looks very divert group, to work together to create an event like this, and we did. And uh, can you please, uh, for all those uh, groups, uh, give them a big hand. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a really great few days. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, when we were thinking about this a year ago, um, I definitely didn't imagine this, so thanks for making this happen. Everyone who helped make, uh, organize this, but also every single attendee who made it great. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I've been told that if there are volunteers who didn't yet get a t-shirt or who still want another one, they can go down to the registration after this and get more. <laughs> um, for Academy, we are going to continue tomorrow at the Technical University. Um, everyone is welcome to join us there for hacking, boffs, and more. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Felix. I'm representing VRC and Videolan, and I'm one of those board members there. And we are, we are happy to be part of this weekend, and we're excited to actually meet users, which is typically something we don't do, and to even welcome users to our codec talks about like low-level mathematics of how videos work. And that was really nice for us, and I hope enjoyable for you, and maybe see you next year. Thanks. Yes, I'd also like to extend another thanks to everybody who has really helped organize the event. You know, something like nine months ago, somebody, something like that, people came to me and said, oh, 
why don't we, you know, organize a bigger conference together with KDE? And then somehow FSFE came in and Video Lane Land came in and I thought it was great. And it's great to see so many people that came here to this event, you know, discussing for a weekend about, you know, the stuff that they're passionate for, what they're doing. And I think, you know, from all I've heard so far, you know, it has been a really great weekend for everybody. You know, we got lots of good stuff out of that. And in the end, you know, it's all of you who are doing all that work on this project that will help us push this forward. So thanks a lot for, to all of you for really contributing to the projects. We had our first FSFE summit here at KuteCon, and I think it was a big success given the good feedback I've heard, which is also due to the very good cooperation that we had here among us organizers of the communities. That makes me happy, but what makes me even more happy is when I heard that um, fellows from the FSFE, political activists were joining developers meeting here and developers were joining our political talks and uh, also how I became aware that there are a lot of people here inside who contribute to more than one community who are part of FSFE and of KDE or end of VLC. And this makes me really happy and I hope that we can have this a similar thing in the future. I think this was a very good thing for all of our communities. So one of the hopes we had when we started this journey was that you guys would not just go to your own, so the KDE developers go to their KDE meetings and so on. So uh, we've been talking a lot about, so did people do that? So uh, I would like you to be completely quiet if you didn't go to anybody's other talk. Clap a bit if you went to some of the other talks. Clap a bit harder if you went to quite a few of talks outside of your own domain. So can I hear you? Awesome. We can clap our own shoulders up here as long as we want, but this wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the more than 140 people who volunteered to do presentations here. So should we all please give those hand, a big hand for, for doing this. It would neither have happened if it hadn't been for those people that had spent their last three days sitting, running the cameras, sitting in booths, sitting in front of the presentators and making sure that they would uh, shut up on time. So anybody who volunteered uh, during those three days, could you please stand up? Quite a few of those indeed. So, last but not least, I want to hear how many of you managed to go to all the talks of this conference. <laughs> okay. Let's just see if there was somebody starting clapping there again. The good news is that a lot of those talks have been uh, recorded already. So, if you go to uh, the cutecon.org page, then at the front page you'll find a link or find a number of links to where you can find those talks that you missed. You can also find the slides if you click on a, a presenter or click on a talk there. You can find the slide as soon as the presenter remembers to upload his slides, so let that be a, a reminder to the presenters. And finally, I'm afraid to say this is over now. Have a pleasant trip home. Thank you. Thank you.